And uh, thank you to um, to the guys at, at Prony, um, Lindsay and Stephen, um, for, for helping facilitate this and setting up the Zoom, the dreaded Zoom. Um, I'm Mark Scott, and as, as Tom pointed out, I'm the author of um, a recent book, recently published, called Among the Kings, The Unknown Warrior, An Untold Story. Um, it's published by Colourpoint Blackstaff Press um, here in, in Northern Ireland. Um, I'm going to talk to you tonight, uh, not so much about the story itself, but probably more about the, the, the backstory and some of the, the research and the little twists and turns that have taken place along the way. Um, this is a project that I have been working on for almost eight years, believe it or not. And um, I was diverted partway through it um, to carry out research for double band films on a documentary called The Man Who Shot the Great War, which um, is about the photography of a local man in the same battalion that I'm gonna talk about tonight called George Hackney. And there's actually a, there's a part of the Hackney archive is with Prony um, at the minute, so it is relevant. And there'll be one or two Hackney photographs that you'll see tonight. Um, that documentary then led to my first book of the same title, The Man Who Shot the Great War. Um, so I, I was sort of diverted off, off course slightly and came back on again recently. Um, luckily with some, some pretty good new research. Um, so I'll talk to you about it now, if I can. I can get up and running here. Okay. Back to the beginning. Sorry about this. <laughs> Begin a quick run through. Okay, so this is uh, the front cover of um, my, my recent publication, Among the Kings. Um, it shows a, a scene from the inside of the Thiepval Memorial in France, um, looking out across the Ancre Valley um, on the, the far side. Some of you may recognize that scene. Um, it is quite relevant as the, the, the story touches on um, ultimately the unknown warrior and the missing um, of the, the First World War. So the story begins with me with this man here, this gentleman who is my great grandfather. Um, this is Sergeant Jimmy Scott, a later Company Sergeant Major Jimmy Scott. And he, um, in this photograph, is serving with the 14th Battalion of the Royal Irish Rifles, the Young Citizen Volunteers, or YCV, as they were known. Um, prior to this, he, and it, it comes out in this, this photograph, this is a, a Hackney, a George Hackney photograph, quite a stunning shot and a, a great photograph to have of a, a, a relative, you know, it's, it's fantastic because he looks, he looks like a cross between Clint Eastwood and Wyatt Earp, you know, but um, well posed image and well taken shot for, for its, its day. Um, this photograph was taken at Seaford in East Sussex when the battalion were involved in weapon training and the, the, the YCV, the 14th battalion, they were an infantry unit, they weren't cavalry. And I think what has happened in this instance is that Jimmy Scott has come out to um, supervise the men on the ranges um, with the horse and Hackney, George Hackney has handed him his rifle. There's one or two little um, points peculiar to that, that actual rifle. Um, that were studied at length in the, the man who shot the Great War. So I think that he's come onto the range, he's met George, George has handed him the rifle and he has posed and George has taken the shot. Um, Jimmy Scott knew how to handle a horse and knew how to handle a weapon from a horse because he had served previously in the Boer War, the Second Boer War with the Royal Irish Fusiliers and then was transferred to Major Goff's Mounted Infantry. So. At the outbreak of the First World War, he was an experienced professional soldier. He was an old sweat, if you like. Um, so the story begins with this man. Um, he uh, helped train the battalion, went to France with the 14th Royal Irish Rifles. And around about February 1916, he came into possession of this little book. Um, it's a tiny little um, pre-printed diary. Um, it's similar in size to what 
um, a column, little columns miniature diary would be like today. Obviously, other diary manufacturers are available, um, but the, that's the sort of size of it. And you can see it has a New Zealand shipping company logo on the front. And quite apt uh, is the, the, the little uh, speech. It's an extract from Shakespeare's Henry V, the famous Band of Brothers, um, St. Crispin's Day speech. For he today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother. Be he ne'er so vile, this day shall gentle his condition. And gentlemen in England, now abed, shall think themselves accursed they were not here and hold their manhoods cheap, whilst any speaks that fought with us upon St. Crispin's Day. So this little book <coughs> came into his possession in February 1916, because he, he wrote a little note in the, the inside cover. Um, he hasn't written very much in it, to be honest. Um, inside, most of it is, is pre-printed, and it, it takes the form of almost an almanac and a little field craft manual. There's parts in it that describe semaphore and Morse code and um, you know, military um, time knots, things like that. So the first note he makes um, on, the, on the first page he, he writes on, it's basically this list of names. Now, I was handed this in 2012, um, literally the day before I was about to go on a trip to the Somme and it was handed to me by a cousin. Um, and this ultimately was returned with Jimmy Scott's effects when he was killed in action, uh, which was in January 1917 um, at Messines, within the shadow actually of, of where the, the Ireland Peace Tower is today, if any of you know it. Um, so this came home, it came home to his widow, and it has passed down the family over the last century as I say, until 2012 when it came into my possession. And it's just a list of names, two, two lists, if you like. There's this first list, which is actually casualties and locations of cemeteries. So you can see, for instance, W. Leach, 21st of March, Forceville. So I didn't know that Forceville related to a cemetery and the other names there, Hamel, or Twil, um, until I actually w went out to the song and started to learn a bit more about what went on. Um, so I, I went to the, the main list there under the, the heading Otwil, killed night of 5th of, and he's written April and then changed it to May. Um, Cause he, it may indicate the state of his mind at, that, at the time and he, he was possibly uh, a little bit confused and uh, hadn't realized that would change month if you like. So he, he, he writes a list of names. Um, I then, when I went to France, first place I went to was Autuil, and I've written about this in the book. Um, it's, it's quite a, a beautiful cemetery. Um, and when you go to it, you don't realize you're arriving at a cemetery until you're actually in it because it's built on a slope and it slopes away from you down towards the River Ancre um, at the back of Thiepval in France. So it struck me that I was standing here with this book um, and the list of names in the book matched the row of graves that you see in this photograph, um, Tollerton, B.D., Sloan, Adams, etc. And it struck me that Jimmy Scott, probably on the morning of the 6th of May, 1916, would have stood here and in front of him, instead of this row of graves, there would have been a row of bodies. And he is noted their names. The interesting thing is on the end, um, you can see it there, a soldier of the Great War, Royal Irish Rifles, 6th of May 1916, known unto God. It's an, an unknown grave. However, it has the regimental crest and the date. And at that point that uh, struck me. And from that moment on, I started researching what happened here. And I took it upon myself to research every name that was in the book. And the, the reason being was that I decided that as a sort of a, a research tool, if you like, or as, a, as a, a technique, I felt that if Jimmy Scott had taken the time to write about these men, simply the name and the, and the location, if I could find their families today um, in modern times, um, would they have anything that related to him or would anything be left in a family archive? related to him. 
um, that I could learn more about him from. And I think that um, most of you, if you hear that, you would think it was quite a naive um, line of research, if you like, but we'll see how it has developed and how um, it has bore fruit, big style. But the, the name on the end, or the, the lack of the name on the end intrigued me. I did a lot of research and dug out the war diaries and the casualty records, which are held at the Ulster Rifles Museum in uh, Waring Street in Belfast. And I came to the conclusion, um, th th there were initially a number of mistakes in these records, and I thought there might have been a, a missed burial or something like that. But eventually then I found a diary entry from another lad that served in the battalion. And he stated that on the night of the 5th and 6th of May, um, there was a, a mortar bombardment. Uh, it was a retaliation from a trench raid that um, troops had carried out slightly to the right of the 14th Battalion. And as a result of the bombardment, the trench collapsed. And all these men, most of them were buried alive. And after the, the, the burials, the formal burials that you see here, um, the men returned to the front line and they found body parts. And this guy uh, made a note that the body parts were put into a sandbag and brought back down to the cemetery here and buried. And I believe that is now what we see. Um, because it was an isolated incident, we can count the casualties and we can count the graves. And there's obviously one more grave than there are casualties. So we can see what has happened here. And the, a bit of research has, has shown that. George Hackney, um, recorded the aftermath of the bombardment. Um, he took a series of photographs, about uh, four, I think in total, that show the devastation within Thiepval Wood at the time. And this photograph shows a frontline trench. You can see that it is a frontline trench because it has a fire step. Um, and you can see how as, as a result of the, the damage, the men have sandbagged up the end, they blocked it off and they put in a lot of wire um, at the end of that little, little buttress. Beyond that is the damaged area. So they're trying to protect that part of the, the trench from any German attackers uh, getting access during a raid. You can also see fresh wire spigots and rolls of wire that, that are uh, about to be taken out probably that night. So th this would have been the aftermath of the attack. Um, and it's, it's remarkable that George has recorded it. He actually he took four photographs during the actual 1st of July battle, which I think is amazing. And they're, they're recorded and you can see them um, in the documentary and in my previous book, The Man Who Shot the Great War. So further on in Jimmy Scott's little notebook, um, the entry changes slightly in that we don't have a list of names and locations of cemeteries. We have surnames and addresses in around Greater Belfast and beyond. Um, what happened was during the 1st of July, Jimmy survived the battle. Um, shortly afterwards, he was promoted company sergeant major. And from the records at Waring Street, we can see that he um, was given quite a considerable amount of leave. He was given three weeks leave in October 1916. And he has come home and he has visited the families that you can see in the book. And it looks like th those that he has been able to get an answer from at the door, if you like, he is, he is ticked. And those that he has, he's crossed out. So again, I started to research all these names and was able to track down most of the families in the book. Um, some, some families today weren't a bit interested, some were very interested and uh, you, you know it's understandable I suppose some people are, are interested in this sort of thing and some people just aren't. Um, so I, I worked my way down the names until I got to the final name that I could, I, I just couldn't decipher it and you can see if you look at the just below the fourth red line down on the right hand page um, you can see the, there's a bit of a scribble and then it says you, you can clearly see Roden Street with a cross through it. Um, but to the left of that, I thought it was, initially I thought it said Fitzy to Roden Street and then Fitz 72 Roden Street. Each time I had to check the census records and the, uh, 
various military records, metal index cards, stuff like that, trying to find names that matched with Roden Street um, and, and those addresses. I, I couldn't find anything. So I generally, I would, I would have just put it to one side and moved on and researched the other names around it. Eventually, one day, I just happened to look at it in a peculiar way. I think I looked at it sort of actually from above, you know, from upside down, if you like. And to me then, it said Fitz 172 Roden Street. So when I checked the records, um, I, I know, I've done something here. Can you still hear me? Yeah. Um, yep. Yeah. So I checked the, uh, the records. <clears throat> I found that there were two brothers um, at 172 Roden Street. Uh, th this, this document is from the, um, the Royal Astor Rifles Museum. Um, it's a casualty record. And it, it not only uh, details casualties, but it um, it shows, like for instance, courses and training and medals awarded. Um, and in it, um, I found two brothers. They're actually Jack and James uh, Fitzsimon. Uh, both at that address, both in B Company of the 14th Royal Irish Rifles, which was Jimmy Scott's company. And um, you can see that they're both Lance Corporals. A different section of the book, um, we can see that James uh, was a first class bomber. Uh, promoted Corporal, 8th April 16. Uh, if you read on, you can see uh, Promoted Sergeant, 1st of July 1916, which was the day of the opening day of the Battle of the Somme. And he was awarded the military medal on that date. His brother then, uh, he was a corporal, and you can see on his record, um, he was hospitalized 1st of July 16, wounded. And then another further entry states, now missing and then now killed, 1st of July, 16. So one brother was awarded the military medal and the second was killed in action. Further on in the book, there's a section for officers. And I could see that on the census, there were actually three um, eligible brothers, if you like, who could have served um, connected to 172 Roden Street. And in the officer section of the book, I find this, this entry. Again, 172 Roden Street with second lieutenant S.E.S. Fitzsimon and he has dropped the S from the end of his name um, and he is attached to C Company. So we've now three brothers, one was a lieutenant and two were in the ranks. Um, I tracked down the family um, through the Great War Forum, some of you may use it, um, and I put in a message um, just really asking if anyone had any knowledge of the uh, three Fitzsimon brothers. Remarkably, and this is one of the real uh, flukes of the research, um, I was contacted by a chap called McFarlane who messaged me and said that his next door neighbour was um, the son of one of the, of one of the Fitzsimon brothers that I was inquiring about. Um, I got in touch with him. He passed me on. He had, had little knowledge of, of, of uh, wartime history, family history, if you like. And he passed me on to um, Dr. John Fitzsimon in Canada. So John met me with uh, another brother called Richard. Uh, John came from Canada. Uh, Richard came up from Dublin. And they both met me with their uh, niece, who is Linda McCauley from BBC Northern Ireland. And we all met together in the, the Ulster Rifles Museum. And they produced a large box of documents and photographs um, that related to the chap on the left of this photograph, who is Ernest Fitzsimon, the officer. I'd never seen such a collection. Um, and this, was a, this photograph came out of it. Um, so you can see here the three brothers in uniform. Um, on the left, as I said, Ernest Fitzsimon. Um, very closely, when you look at his uniform, he is wearing Queen's University Officer Training Corps uh, collar tags, little collar badges. And the other two brothers 
Um, moving right from him is uh, Jack, who was killed in action on the 1st of July. And then on the far right, you have James, the, the lad who won the military medal. So I contacted John. John came, as I said, and met me. And he, uh, during the conversation, he made a comment and he said, um, yes, um, my father, he was a major by the end of the war. Uh, he survived the war. This is Ernest on the left of the photograph here. And he said, and he, he made an offhand comment, and he said, and yes, at the, after the war was over, he did that thing with the unknown warrior. So I sort of thought, right, okay. Um, and took it with a pinch of salt, but he kindly allowed me to retain the photographs and the material that, it, that he had brought. And I started to examine it. And the first, uh, one of the first images that I produced or I, I had a look at was this one. And it shows three officers, Ernest Fitzsimon, who we now know, um, in the center. Uh, on the right is uh, William Allen, who was, uh, had previous to this photograph, um, been in charge of the 16th uh, Royal Irish Rifles Pioneers. And on the left is an officer called Moore, a captain. And you can see in the background, there's the uh, Ocean Assurance Building. And this is actually taken at the front of the City Hall in Belfast, um, looking across towards um, the, the, the Ocean Assurance Building on Donegal Square East. Um, now the thing that struck me about this photograph was that if we look to the left of Captain Moore, um, you can see two ladies, one is sort of craning her neck to look around them. And that lady is actually my uh, great grandmother. That is Jimmy Scott's widow. And the lady beside her is her mother. So straight away, I'd made the link, I'd, I'd, I'd put out this message on the Great War Forum. This gentleman had come all the way from Canada and he brought this stuff with him and produces a photograph of my great grandmother. And I thought, wow, you know, things have sort of come full circle with this. But it's not the first, um, it, it wasn't to be the, the, the first strange event, if you like, the, out of all of this. So um, you can see here that Ernest Fitzsimon in the center, and in this image, he's wearing a, a, an MBE medal, and he's wearing general staff uniform. I later found out that this photograph was taken in 1923. Um, on the 11th of November at the City Hall at the uh, Remembrance Day commemorations, hence the wreaths. Um, and he was presenting a wreath with the other two officers there on behalf of the 36th Ulster Division Officers Association, the Veterans Association. So I began then to look at the other images in the collection and it became apparent there were a number of photographs that related to the Unknown Warrior operation in 1920, November 1920. Um, and speaking to John, and it is, it's another thing that I've, I've discovered through all of this, family myths. Um, there tends to be, in my, in now in my experience, always something to a family myth. And the family myth relating to this photograph was that John had told me that his father had planned the operation um, on the French side to recover the body of the unknown warrior. Um, as I said, initially I'd taken that with a pinch of salt because when you look these things up, you find General Wyatt and um, Reverend Kendall, Reverend Realton, um, General McDonough, Rudyard Kipling, the King, you know, you've all these people, and there's never any Fitzsimon mentioned. Um, so he, he produced these photographs and straight away you could see that th there is some link with the Unknown Warrior. But one of the stories that he told me was that his father, in the planning of the operation, he had arranged that a gun carriage be brought to the Citadel at Boulogne um, and that the, the body of the Unknown Warrior, which had been um, guarded overnight by French troops at the Citadel, on the night of the 9th into the 10th of November 1920, um, 
the, the, the gun carriage would come, collect the body, and bring uh, the coffin down to HMS Verdun, um, where Marshal Foch and General McDonough were waiting. Um, so he had said, John had told me that when the French troops arrived, they didn't bring a gun carriage, they brought a general service wagon. And that his father went into a total rage um, because he had specifically um, instructed that a gun carriage be used. So I, I produced the, this photograph was produced from the collection. I started to look at it. And over on the right, I could see Ernest Fitzsimon. And you can see him there. He's just to the right of the what looks like a searchlight structure on the ship between it and the end of the photograph in, in the center. There's a group of four British officers and one French officer. Um, when you zoom it in, you can see the, the second British officer from the right is Fitz. Um, he appears to be um, in a bit of a rage. He, he, he doesn't look happy. He's, he's not standing um, so, you know, front on, if you like, paying attention to, the, to what's happening. He's, he's turned side on, his arms out. And it looks actually like the veins in his neck are standing out. So, so here we have a within this photograph, we have maybe a bit of confirmation that the family myth um, may have been correct, um, and that this story about the gun carriage there may be something to it. Certainly, the photograph itself, there is no gun carriage. There's a general service wagon, but. I've looked at a number of photographs of the Unknown Warrior operation on this side of the channel, on the French side, and to be honest, I hadn't given it a second thought, but there you are. So things started to sort of come together um, with, the, uh, with the documents that I was looking at. Um, there's a, a whole series of photographs that um, show proceedings at Boulogne on the morning of the 10th of November. Um, in this one, which unfortunately it's slightly, slight long exposure on it, and which has allowed a few of the figures to move and hence blur out slightly. But on the left there, you can see Fitzsimon, and just to his right, you can see Marshal Foch, and to the right, I believe that is uh, General Wyatt, um, who was um, ultimately in charge of the, the, the French side of the, the operation. Um, also in this, it's just been actually discovered that we have the, the Reverend George Kendall. Um, if you can see just between Fitz or Fitzsimon and Marshall Foch, you can just about see a gentleman with quite a, a roundish face um, in British military uniform, but with a dog collar. So that has just been identified as George Kendall, who was involved in the operation. So all these series of images, once you started to put them together, um, it started to add weight to what John had told me, that his father was involved in the Unknown Warrior operation. So not only that, <coughs> we then um, produced this photograph from the collection. It shows um, what I believe is a Vauxhall car um, with uh, the four, four soldiers, two officers and two other ranks, and a little dog. And there's a, a tattered Union Jack flag draped over the, uh, the, the, the windscreen of the car. So again, the problem with all of these photographs is there's no annotation to them. And we have to try and figure out who is in them. So further on in the collection, I found this, it was a copy of the uh, Daily Mirror, dated the 28th of October 1921. And the story there that they're covering, it's uh, headed last of the BEF in France. And it states, the last of the BEF to leave the war area in France and Flanders, Major E.S. Fitzsimon, Centre, Lieutenant C.W. Hardwick, C.S.M. Pratt and Lance Corporal Parker. The tattered Union Jack on the car has seen seven years service. And below that, you can see a dog. Unfortunately, on, on this slide, it's the, uh, the writing there is blurred out, but basically that little dog is called Old Bill. And Old Bill was along with them. Um, the, uh, the flag, incidentally, um, 
today can be seen in the Psalm Association Museum at Conlig. Um, it was left there uh, with a number of um, effects that belong to Ernest Fitzsimon um, outside of the collection that I was looking at. So uh, there are a number of items there relating to him and to his, his, his brothers. Uh, there's, for instance, James's medals um, are on display there. But the flag is there and we were able to match up the flag that they have with the one in this image and the tattered segments, particularly the long, there's like a long stringy uh, tattered section on the right hand edge. Um, it matches um, exactly with the flag that's in the Psalm Centre. So it is the same one. So in, in, in that then I had, had, had more names to work with, if you like, with Lieutenant C.W. Hardwick. Um, and I adopted a, a similar uh, line of inquiry, if you like, with this archive. So initially I'd gone down through the names that Jimmy Scott had written um, and tracked down the families as far back as I could. So I then began to do this again with this part of the archive and first of all identify the images in the photographs that I had and then again um, research each of those names and find out really effectively what they knew um, about Fitzsimon or about the Unknown Warrior operation. Um, so now I had another name, Hardwick, and I could put a, a face to it. There's also the Sergeant Major there, Pratt, and a uh, Lance Corporal called Parker. So in another part of the collection, there was this um, extract from the Sunday Independent. Unfortunately, I don't have a date for it, but I believe it's probably around 1966. And it's titled Soldier Dog. And there's a photograph of Old Bill. It's a, a crop from the previous image, if you like. And I'll just read this. Being a dog lover, I, and I'm sure many more Sunday Independent readers, Noted with interest, Colonel E.S. Fitzsimon's story of the terrier Old Bill, who survived the 1914-18 war in France. We have to have a dog story. It always has to be a dog story. Um, alas, Old Bill had a sad end after those terrible war years. The late Sir Cedric, Sir Cedric Hardwick says in his book, Let's Pretend. So again, we have Hardwick mentioned. Um, everybody had loved Old Bill, for he was a real soldier, and he had loved everybody in return. To my dismay, I discovered that the quarantine restri restrictions would prevent me taking him back to England, and I felt heartbroken at the thought of having to leave him at St. Paul with the French, who naturally would have little sentiment for him. Eventually, I wrote to an English man in Paris, whom I had known slightly, explaining the position, and he at once agreed to have the dog. He met old Bill at the station and took him home to the suburbs, but Bill hated civilian life, and a few days later was found lying dead at the station. I shall always think that he found his way there, hoping to rejoin his old friends, the Tommies, and finding the station full of unimportant civilians died of disappointment. So there we have the story of Old Bill. Um, but importantly for me, there was a mention there that Sir Cedric Hardwick had written this in his book, Let's Pretend. So I started to troll the internet and find a copy of Let's Pretend. And in it, Sure enough, there was the story of Old Bill. There's the book. Um, the book was written in, I think it was 1933, um, 1935. And uh, in it, we have the same photograph that we have just seen that came from the Fitzsimon collection. And the annotation to it is, the last British officers to leave France. Cedric Hardwick is standing on the extreme right of the picture. Old Bill is sitting on the car. So again, we have uh, Cedric Hardwick um, identified. And also in the book, Cedric writes about the unknown warrior. And <clears throat> I'll just read from, from the original here. Uh, quote, he states, it was at St. Paul that the body of the unknown warrior was selected. It devolved upon me to hoodwink the special newspaper correspondents who came from England to find out all about it. 
I hope these gentlemen have long since forgiven me the wild goose chases I sent them to faraway villages whenever any decisive step was being taken. I never walked past the cenotaph without recollecting the night when I mounted guard with other officers over the body of the unknown warrior until dawn in the makeshift chapel of St. Paul. It was an unforgettable experience. So we have Cedric there, effectively one of the officers that mounted guard. And we know now that it, it was all officers who mounted that guard um, and probably all officers that were involved in the operation. There were no other ranks um, involved. And he states there, and it's quite important, that he was purposely involved in leading the press, a merry dance, if you like, and taking them to places that weren't relevant in the operation um, in the run-up to the 11th of November. Um, in 1916, or sorry, 1920. So we have this suggestion that there is misinformation, if you like, um, out there relating to the story of the Unknown Warrior. And when you research the story itself, um, you, you do find a lot of different versions and the, there's, there's um, different numbers of bodies, for instance, that were brought for the, the selection. Um, in some accounts there's six, in some there's five, in one there's three. And there's this confusion, if you like, out there. And it could well be due to the misinformation that was put out at the time. So Ced Cedric Hardwick was attached to a unit um, along with Fitzsimon at that time called the Director of Graves Registration and Inquiry. And it was their responsibility um, to help or to uh, try to um, recover and identify bodies and bury them uh, properly, uh, bodies that were recovered from the battlefields of France and Belgium. So they were in exactly the unit um, that were responsible for carrying out the Unknown Warrior operation. Again, um, from the, the Fitz archive, I find this document, uh, which is like gold dust. Um, when you're looking at a, a, a unit like this, um, you can see it's, it's titled Headquarters, British Troops in France and Flanders, which was at St. Paul at the time, which was where the Unknown Warrior oper operation took place. And it's, it's basically um, a, a list of responsibilities, if you like, for, for the, the various officers. And you can see Staff Duties Q, Q Branch, Staff Officer, Major SES, Fitzsimon, MBA, D-A-Q-M-G, um, and beneath him, various other names. Um, if we go to almost the bottom right, underneath uh, column F, you see Lieutenant C.H. Hardwick. Above him, you see a Captain A.W. Smith, OBE, and there's another Smith up at the top, um, two below Fitzsimon, uh, Captain um, C.M. Smith. MC, Royal Army Service Corps, RASC. So there's other names here, but I've, I've highlighted those because they'll, they'll become relevant shortly. Um, so I started then researching these names um, to try again and, and, and bottom out uh, their knowledge of the Unknown Warrior. And in amongst uh, the collection was this letter and uh, this was addressed or to Fitz, and it was sent by Captain A. W. Smith, um, who you could see was the Cap Commandant just above Cedric Hardwick, on the 13th of October, and I believe that night to be 1921. So Fitz had been the, the, the last, one of the last soldiers to leave in 1921, the last original BEF soldiers to leave. And that, that was on the 28th of October. So this letter, uh, it was dated the 13th, quite close to them. And Smith states, I'll try and read it. I'll, I'll read from this, this version. I, I was going to do a, um, a tight version of it, but I'll just, I'll read through the original here, um, just so that you can see how it's written. Um, Dear Fitz, having read in the Daily Mail that there are still two officers, as well as the Colonel, still left in France, I'm certain that you are one of them. I'll be... Um, I bet he'll be there till the rats leave the raft. 
has turned out quite true. So there's obviously a little in joke there amongst them. Um, let's have a line letting us know what you're going to do when you come, when you, when you come home. Um, I often see Standing, who I've now identified as the, the Reverend George Standing. And again, he, this name becomes relevant. And a lot of the names that I'm going to mention here now will, will become quite relevant. And if you try and keep them in mind, um, I often see Standing. And we talk over old times and the board. Now, the board, I believe, I could be wrong here, there's nothing to confirm it, but I believe that the board is the term that these officers gave to the selection process. I feel like it was a secret operation, and every secret operation has to have a name so that people can talk about it um, openly without others um, realizing what they're talking about. So I believe that the board was actually the selection process um, itself. So he, he talks about old times and the board. Um, I believe, can't make that out. Uh, yeah, yeah, sorry, I believe Williams has gone to Santa Omer. Again, Williams, quite an important name. Um, we'll come to that. Uh, Jenny is with you, I suppose, and Gwen. I haven't been able to identify those two. And I'm going to see the Brody. Again, is an important name, and it's interesting the way it's written, the Brody. Someday soon, probably Sunday. Here that Taylor is fine, and in Paris, Hills, which again is an important name, and young Richards are here too. Um, have had a couple of games of hockey in the RASC team here. Outside right, of course. We could do with you and Williams. Why the juice? Didn't you take regular commissions? when you could have had them in, in the asking. Is Colonel Sutton still with you? Please remember me to him if he is, and also to Colonel Dick Cunningham and Mrs. DC. Uh, give my love to Jenny and GW if they're still there. What have you done with Palmer, I think, and all the good old Vauxhalls? What about 45708, the chocolate car, and the indispensable Lance Corporal Parker? Well, we've seen Parker, um, he was in the last four BEF photograph, and we've also seen the chocolate car, uh, 45708, which is the number actually on the bonnet of that car in the photograph, uh, the, the Vauxhall. So for some reason, they call it the chocolate car. Will you be staying in London at all when you cross? If so, could meet up and see you. Um, couldn't we do a club dinner? Cheerio. Yours forever. A.N. Smith. So that was a letter from Smith. So I started to go through the names we had in there. And I come up with a name, the, the Brody. Um, I searched uh, for, for that name um, on the internet, on, on all the usual uh, places. And um, I came up with this lady, uh, Vera, Margaret Vera Brody of Brody. Um, which is a castle. It's, it's now in the hands of the Scottish National Trust in Moray in Scotland. And uh, it was the, the, the clan home, if you like, of the, the Brodie family. Um, so th this, I believe, was Vera Brodie. I wasn't sure. Um, I was going by her metal ribbons. Um, you can see that it looks like she has the full set of three First World War medals, which means she would have served since 19... 14 or 15. Um, there's another image over here in another group photograph in the collection and you can now quite clearly see that there are three medals there. Um, so I again check records and find that there was a Vera Brody who had served from 1915 as a VAD nurse and had then, um, after the war, transferred um, into a senior position. She was a senior officer within the um, Women's Army Auxiliaries, the fledgling um, Queen Mary's Women's Army Auxiliary Corps. And she was attached to St. Paul. So when I did more searching on her, I found that the National Army Museum actually held a document, uh, two documents, um, which were typewritten accounts of her service. And there's one thing that I'd found when researching the, the story of the Unknown Warrior, and, and I, I covered extensively in, in, in the book, 
is that there seems to be a mistake um, with the current standard narrative relating to the dates of the operation. And this stems from an account that General Wyatt had published in the Daily Telegraph in um, 1939. And in it, he states that the operation started on the 7th of November, 1920, and the selection took place on the night of the 7th into the 8th. Um, and the, if, if you work that out on a timeline, um, you end up that, that there has to be a, a day missing because you don't arrive um, on, on the 11th of November at Westminster Abbey. Um, once you start to factor in the events that we know as fact, you know, for instance, the, the photograph that we've seen of the, the key side of the HMS Verdun, um, and we know the date of that and what happened the day before that and what happened the day before that. But once you start to, to run it back, you don't arrive at the 7th. So there's a bit of a mistake or there's some anomaly that, that, that isn't correct. And the two accounts that I found at the National Army Museum, um, Vera Brody uh, states quite clearly that on the morning of the 9th of November, uh, 1920, um, she got up, basically, uh, was moving about the camp at St. Paul and saw that there was a notice attached um, stating that the body of the unknown warrior would be lying for an hour um, in the chapel um, for, for people to come and pay their respects, which she did. So that was the morning after the selection, which was the 9th. Um, so we can now start to think that the selection took place on the 8th into the 9th of November 1920, not the 7th and 8th, which had been previously reported um, as coming from General Wyatt. So later on, I found actually a 1935 account uh, written by General Wyatt, and he himself states quite clearly that the selection took place on the 8th into the 9th. Um, so I think we can really nail that down now, and there may have been some mistake um, between the the letter arriving at the newspaper and the actual article being being published, um, so the identification of Vera Brody assisted in that. And th there was a collection of photographs at Brody Castle. Um, one was sent to me by Jimmy Barn, the curator there. And you can see here, um, it's really the shape of the nose. I think when you look at the the three images, so we were able to establish. Um, an identity, if you like, and, and to, uh, to confirm that that was Vera Brody yeah, that had seen in the, the Fitzsimon photographs. Um, on the 7th of November, um, an event took place at Amiens. And this again, initially had raised my suspicion that something was wrong with the Unknown Warrior date. Um, there's a series of photographs in the collection. This is just one of them. And they show um, events outside this cathedral. Initially, I didn't know where the cathedral was. So I had to go on Google Earth and look at every cathedral in France until I find this is actually the, the west transept of Amiens Cathedral, which would be correct. Um, it, it is in the, the area of the Somme. Um, and it, we can see in the centre here, it's been marked I think, by John um, Fitzsimon's son, or maybe by Fitz himself. Uh, we can see Fitz, um, Major Fitzsimon. Um, on the left of him there, you can see Marshal Foch. The officer to the left of him is General Colfilippo. Um, on the right, the gentleman with the top hat has been identified as Andrew Fisher, the former uh, Premier of Australia. Um, and to his right, the two men there are, is, are General McDonough and General Wyatt, who were um, ultimately in charge of the Unknown Warrior operation. But this is the 7th of November. Um, the, all these men came together um, for a ceremony to commemorate the uh, defense of Amiens by the Australian and Anzac forces. And uh, they unveiled a, a large plaque, which is still there today. You can still see it within the cathedral. So I thought to myself, okay, 7th of November, um, surely these men, Wyatt and McDonough uh, and Fitzsimon, should be involved in supervising 
the Unknown Warrior operation some 30 or 40 miles away at St. Paul. What are they doing here at this event instead? So that, that's what led me to question the, the date issue, uh, which has now been resolved. Um, the other significance of this photograph is that <clears throat> one of the other family myths, if you like, within the Fitzsimon family was that um, it had been passed down that Marshall Foch had not intended to attend the Unknown Warrior, the British Unknown Warrior um, uh, event, if you like, um, until he had met Fitz at Amiens. And as a result of talking to Fitzsimon, um, he discovered what they were about to do um, and th that they were about to, to, to choose the Unknown Warrior and bring the body ultimately to Boulogne, where it would then be taken by HMS Verdun to England. And as a result of hearing this, um, the family myth, if you like, stated that Foch changed his plans and stayed in Amiens and attended the ceremony at Boulogne. Now, we've seen him in the previous photograph, the, the long photograph, uh, and the other one with the Reverend Kendall, or, yeah, with, with the Reverend Kendall. We've seen him at Boulogne, so he did attend, so that is fact. Um, I then discovered within, uh, there's a friend who uh, Tom um, knows, um, uh, Mike Jackson, and he very kindly um, had obtained for me from Q a copy of the operational order for the Unknown Warrior operation. Um, and in it, there's all the, the intricate details, particularly in, in, in and around Dover and London of who does what and who stands where and all the rest of it. But in it is a telegram um, addressed, uh, sent from Lord, Lord, Lord Darby, who was the consul, British consul in Paris, uh, to England. And it's marked secret and it basically advises them that Marshal Foch has unexpectedly decided to attend the Unknown Warrior um, uh, event at Boulogne and that he should be uh, suitably thanked for his attendance, formally thanked, if you like. So here we have in, in, in this document, we, it basically nails down the family myth. Also within the Fitz collection is um, Marshall Foch's calling card. So it, it's obviously obvious that the two men did meet. Well, we can see them both together here. And that um, Foch handed Fitz, Fitz his card. So um, it just, just adds more weight um, to the, uh, the, the background to that myth. So again, then back to this document, and I've mentioned the chap, um, Cecil Miller Smith. Um, he's uh, mentioned about the fourth or fifth line down there from the top uh, as a captain. Um, Cecil Smith came from Jamore, County Down, from Church Street. And he was a professional soldier, just just a professional soldier as the war kicked off. Um, he had gone to Sandhurst uh, Military Academy, was commissioned from Inst in Belfast, uh, where he had studied. And uh, he was commissioned into the uh, Royal Engineers. And then he spent some time with the Enniskillen Fusiliers, where he was awarded the Military Cross for gallantry, and returned back to the Royal Engineers and then the Army Service Corps, as we can see it, he's attached to here, whereupon he was attached to St. Paul, uh, to the DGRE after the war. With him being a, a professional soldier, um, he wasn't on a temporary commission, so when the war ended, he wasn't. Um, uh, he, was, he, he, he could remain within the army as an officer and proceed with his career, whereas those on temporary commissions had to then leave. Um, that wasn't the case with him. Indeed, he went on to serve in the Second World War with distinction. Um, he had, in the meantime, he carried out engineering proje projects in India and the Far East. Uh, was a matriculated student with Queen's University where he um, uh, studied engineering. He devised a method of repairing uh, heavy machinery and tanks in North Africa 
which was like a mobile workshop um, set up where he could um, they could repair uh, heavy equipment on the move anywhere in the desert. And he was commended for that work by Montgomery. Um, so it, he was later knighted, became Sir Cecil Miller Smith. So very successful military career. Um, but back in 1920, he was a lieutenant in the DGRE, Department of Graves Registration and Inquiry. And here you can see the sort of before and after, if you like. Um, you can see him in later life. Um, and at St. Paul itself um, as a lieutenant. Now Cecil Smith, um, he comes into the story in that he, uh, the Reverend Collins at Westminster Abbey in 1980, uh, every year, practically every November, um, a stories appear in the press um, over the last century outlining the unknown warrior operation and uh, adding a bit of intrigue and a bit of mix. And, um, so basically the Reverend Collins at Westminster had published the story of the unknown warrior in the Daily Telegraph. Cecil Smith had seen it and he corrected him on uh, a number of points. Um, the main point being the, the whereabouts of the three bodies that weren't selected. Uh, the Reverend Collins had repeated uh, General Wyatt's 1939 account, and in it, General Wyatt states that the three bodies were buried nearby in the cemetery at St. Paul. Um, Cecil Smith, I'll not read the, the, the whole account, um, but it's, it, it's in the book. Um, Cecil Smith, he basically states that um, Collins had perpetuated um, this, this incorrect point that Wyatt had written in 39 and that the bodies were not buried at St. Paul. And he said he alludes to what did happen and he states that if you don't print it, I'll tell you what, what happened. So the Reverend Collins obviously wants to know and he says, yeah, okay. And a second letter then is sent from Smith. Now, both these letters um, today are held with the, the Westminster Abbey um, muniments room in their archives and can be read. And in the second letter, he describes this um, ambulance journey, basically where he is, he himself uh, drives an ambulance with the Reverend Standing, if you recall, I mentioned earlier in the, the other Smith letter, and uh, a major called Williams. So you have Smith, Standing and Williams, and they take the three bodies that weren't selected to be the Unknown Warrior um, immediately after the selection took place. So you're talking the early hours of the 9th of November, 1920, and they drive from St. Paul with the bodies out to a location which he states um, was on the Albert Bapom Road. Um, where the bodies were left um, to be found again, if you like, by search parties. Now his account at that point changes from first person to third person, if you read the account carefully. And I think that with this being a, a secret operation, there was no one officer here that knew everything that was going on. Each person just knew their own little piece. And I think that where his account changes from first to third person, that shows the extent of his knowledge of what actually happened. Um, a photograph that had appeared in the Fitzsimon collection also appeared in a copy of this book, uh, The British Military Cemeteries in the region of Boulogne-sur-Mer, which is written by Janine Waltram. Obviously quite an, a niche um, market book, if you like. Um, but in it, she had written about St. Paul, which is in the boulogne sur area. And on the left of this um, set of three images, you can see the image as it appeared in her book. Now, this intrigued me because on the far right, you can see the image as it appeared in the Fitzsimon collection. And beneath her uh, 
version, it says the three soldiers on the left belong to the group in charge of the reburial of the three bodies, meaning the three unknown warrior bodies. From left to right, the Reverend Standing, Lieutenant Smith and Major Williams, photo private collection. She doesn't mention Fitzsimon. Um, so this intrigued me. How did she come upon this photograph? Um, if it didn't come from, you know, if it, if it had come from the Fitzsimon collection, why did she not name Fitzsimon? So had it then come from one of the other three men? And again, based on the, 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 the research technique that I was using, you know, if, if that was the case, um, what other information had that person got? And who had Janine Watron been in touch with? So I was able to track down Janine Watron, um, 93 years of age. And I was able to contact her by email. Um, she is a member of the Dickensian Society. Um, and is quite high profile um, within that and, and similar organizations. So I was able to get in touch with her and communicated with her by email just in um, April and May of this year. Uh, she um, emailed me back and said, yes, she had seen one of the accounts that Cecil Miller Smith had written in uh, the Telegraph. This is one of the, the response to the Reverend Collins, I feel like the, the one that could be published. So Janine Waldron had seen this and she'd written to Smith and she had asked him um, about the Unknown Warrior and about the rel relevance of St. Paul. And he had replied to her, he sent her two letters. And in one of the letters was a photograph. And the original photograph is in the center here. And you can see that it differs from the Fitzsimon one in that there is a scratch um, on the, the negative or on the plate. Um, right across Fitzsimon. It seems to run really along the line of his Sam Brown belt and out across his left wrist. And there's also a part of the number seven uh, on, on her printed version. And on the original, you can see that that's actually part of number 73, which doesn't appear on the Fitzsimon one. So she was sent this photograph by um, Cecil Smith. And it came along with two letters. And I'll read to you from one of them because I have the original here. And it's dated the 8th of October 1985, Major General Sir Cecil Smith, Southfield Place, Weybridge, Surrey. Um, dear Madam, uh, thank you for the courtesy of your letter, asking me if you could use an extract from my, la my letter to Westminster Abbey. Uh, the answer is that, of course, I should be honored if you wish to do so. May I apologize for, for my writing. My, my eyes are no longer very good. Uh, they are in their 90th year. And the, the handwriting is very difficult. You have to excuse me when I'm trying to decipher it here. Um, uh, I'm interested to hear of the book that you have written. Um, pardon me, no, this is important, so I'll have to get this right. <laughs> pardon me, but I note that you wrote English Warrior. Um, he is, I hope, after all the trouble we went, or, or after all the trouble we took, a British warrior. So he makes that point. She has obviously written, she's, she is French, so she has, has written this, you know, the English Warrior. And he goes on then to state that um, <clears throat> he will never forget the ambulance journey from uh, St. Paul's or Ternois to Albert and then on to the Bapaum Road. It was a cold night and I was driving and the driver's, driver's uh, in, in the driver's seat and the ambulance had no windscreen and no, no side doors. And he then goes on to state that the ambulance broke down and that the next day, um, him and another had then went um, to Boulogne. And they booked into a hotel and stayed overnight waiting to see the, uh, the, the procession of the Unknown Warrior the next day. 
And he states in that that it was himself, uh, Major Williams, and he specifically states that the officer on the right, who he names as Major Fitzsimon, was not involved in the ambulance journey. Um, so what happened was uh, how these came into my possession, quite a sad story. Um, Janine Watron told me that once France came out of lockdown from COVID, uh, which was to be the 12th of May, she would be able to get to the post office and send me these, these letters and this photograph um, for inclusion in my book. Um, I didn't hear from her. Um, uh, I didn't hear anything until June. And I received um, a letter from her son, actually, who told me that on the 24th of May, she was involved in an accident in Boulogne and killed. And uh, he knew, uh, because she had been talking to him, um, he had knew the importance of the, the photograph and he was aware that it was to be sent to me. So uh, we have them here and we have the photograph and you're looking at it now. And it helps to, uh, to prove that part of the story and of, of the men involved. And actually, if, if you look at the images, you can see that the three men, the Reverend Standing, um, Cecil Smith and Williams, um, they're all wearing boots and putties. But Simon on the right is wearing his dress trousers. And I, my interpretation of that is that they're either about to go out and do the work, or they're, they're, you know, they're, they're getting ready to do that ambulance run, or they have just returned from it and they've met up with Fitzsimon and had the photograph taken. Um, they're dressed really to be out in the field, if you like, and Fitzsimon isn't. And again, it hints at his role um, and what his role may have been uh, as a, more of a planning um, officer. So I, I like this photograph. Um, again, within the Fitzsimon collection, there's this image Hockey match Ireland v the rest of the world, 26th of October 1920. So quite close to the date of the Unknown Warrior. And we can see the Ireland team. And in the back row from the left, there is Cecil Smith, uh, Fitzsimon, and Williams. Unfortunately, I haven't identified any of the other men in, in the, the photograph, but I think it's important to note that um, Ireland could fill or could field a full team, and the rest of the world obviously couldn't. Um, you know, there isn't an, an England or a Scotland or Welsh team. And it's probably indicative of what was going on in Ireland at the time. If these men had the opportunity to remain in France, um, the war was over, and they could do this job. It was a, a dirty job, body recovery. Um, they could, their choice, I suppose, was to remain there, uh, retain their commissions, um, and uh, or uh, return to Ireland, and particularly in Ireland at that time uh, was a dangerous place for ex-intelligence officers in particular. Um, we've just, um, within the last week, we've, we've, we've read and seen about the, the, the Bloody Sunday massacres at Crook Park and the, the uh, events leading up to that, um, where a number of officers were, were murdered. So Ireland was a dangerous place, and probably, it, it may explain why um, we can see a, uh, a larger amount of, of Irish lads um, electing to remain, if you like, in France. Now, the, the, the other images in the collection, as I say, there's the majority of the people photographed um, have not yet been identified. And just as an example of that, I'll show you this group photograph. On the bottom left there, you can see Vera Brody, who we've spoken about. Top right, with Cecil Smith, um, his head quite prominent there um, on the skyline, if you like. Um, in front of him, on the far right as well, is Cedric Hardwick, who we've spoken about. Um, in front of him, coming down, is the other um, A.N. Smith, who wrote the letter to Fitz. And to his left is Major Williams. And on the front row then, we have uh, General Wyatt um, and Gail, who was involved as well. And um, 
you can see Fitz, the second row in, fourth from the right. Um, I've just added the names here, the Reverend Standing, um, close to the center. So basically all, you know, there's 40 people in this photograph and I've only been able, been able to identify 11. Uh, however, out of those 11, 10 of them have yielded information, if you like. Um, you know, when you look into the, their history, they have either written or spoken about or, or, or left records that relate to the unknown warrior. So there's a lot of information there still to be obtained. <clears throat> the next um, document I'll talk, I'll only talk briefly about it really, but um, Jason Davison, who I think is, is online tonight with us, um, is a, a film producer along with uh, his colleague Pete Roche. Uh, they work for Squeaky Pedal Productions. And back about this time last year, uh, they were working with me um, with the, the intention of producing a documentary on, on this story, really. Um, again, it was, uh, I'd explain to them um, my line, really, and that if we can identify as many people in the photographs um, within the collection, try and track down their archives, um, their personal family archives, if you like, and um, there is an opportunity then that we can maybe dig out more information. So they found, um, recorded at Q, a reference to a captain called Fisher. And again, we're looking at the, the lower ranking officers in, in the operation. We know what Wyatt and McDonough and what those people have all said, uh, the big history people, if you like. Um, but you've seen that once we tap into what, um, for instance, Lieutenant Smith um, had to say, um, he was a, a lower ranking officer in the operation, but yet um, he, he played a role in it and he, he wrote about it. So uh, Jason and Pete found this document um, belonging to a captain called Jack Fisher, Albert Fisher. And it was recorded at Kew, but it was held at Westminster Abbey. So there was a bit of confusion um, about how it had how it came to light. But at any rate, they were at Westminster Abbey and they had asked um, to see the Unknown Warrior papers that are held there. And this document was produced along with them. And it's marked secret and it's addressed to the OC GRU 14, which is Graves Registration Unit 14. Um, that at that time was uh, Captain Fisher. The date at the very bottom is the 6th of November 20. Uh, copy to Colonel Tronson, who we have seen in a photo, the previous photograph. He was in the front row. And um, there's also J uh, or RWW Hills Major. Again, if you can remember back to the, the other Smith letter, which I, I, I worked through, um, he mentioned uh, Hills in it. And it's headed Cagney Corps BC. And it says, please arrange for a party of four French civilians equipped with shovels for exhumation work and an ambulance capable of proceeding to St. Paul and back to be at the above named cemetery at 15, 15 hours, November the 8th. So again, once we line this document up with what we know from Brody and the date issue, the date now becomes relevant. Um, you will... Uh, you will see that they are there and hand them on arrival to Lieutenant Colonel N.G. Tronson, commanding number one district. Having done this, you will return to your camp and remain there in case you're needed. The ambulance driver should be a Frenchman also. So instead of instructing lower ranked British soldiers to do this work, Captain Fisher has to find effectively four French Frenchmen, four laborers and a French driver. Uh, to drive the British Army Ambulance. Um, so point two, at 2200 hours, the same date, <coughs> pardon me, you will again return to the cemetery with the French labour, equipped as before, plus lanterns, and re-inter in the cemetery three bodies, graves having been dug in the meantime. For this work, you will not be needed, but will be required to stand by in your camp. The contents of this document will not be communicated to anyone, and you will arrange for the civilian labour yourself. I will come and see you on Sunday, which was the 7th, um, to ensure all plans are satisfactory. 
So this secret document um, issued to Captain Fisher. Um, it had remained uh, basically with his family. It had remained with him. Um, he hadn't spoke about it to anyone. He hadn't showed it to anyone. And um, when he died, uh, his son uh, lived in the house. Uh, the son hadn't seen it either. And when the son passed away in 2007, um, the family uh, were clearing out the house and found this um, at the back of a, a writing bureau. I was able to track down um, Fisher's granddaughter. Um, she was to have been um, in this meeting tonight, but unfortunately she couldn't make it. A lady called Sandra Hewitt. And Sandra was able to tell me the background of, of this document and how it came to light. Um, it was then um, lodged with the Public Records Office uh, by her mother. So a relatively recent document. And is this then the fate of the three bodies that, that, that weren't selected? Is this what this um, describes as happening? Uh, where three graves are dug at this cemetery called Cagney Court. Um, unfortunately, if this is the end of the story, and um, Cecil Smith's account of the ambulance journey um, to the Albert Bapom Road, it, maybe that's the, the beginning, if you like. We don't know what took place in the middle. Um, we know the extent of Smith's knowledge at the point where he changes from first to third person. And um, we don't know beyond that, but yet we have this, which is effectively an order. And the fact that it was kept for so long um, tells me that it was an order that was carried out. Because if I had to carry out what's instructed here, um, if I was Captain Fisher, I would have been very suspicious of what I was being asked to do. And I would have kept this um, simply to keep, keep myself right um, in case someone came to feel my color, if you like. <laughs> um, later on down the line. So <clears throat> I examined the graves and the, the um, burial returns that are available on the Commonwealth War Graves Commission website relating to Cagney Court Cemetery. And I find that Captain Fisher was actually working there on the 10th of November, 1920. So the first working day, if we assume that he effectively did a, a night shift, if you like, on the 8th into the 9th, the next day, um, he's at that cemetery and he's at plot two, row A, and he buries two graves, uh, two bodies in two graves. However, he doesn't, th this is a, a, the start of a new row um, when you look at the plan, and he doesn't bury these bodies right at the edge. He comes out some considerable distance and, and buries them. Um, and he marks them initially one and two. You can see his, his record is typewritten. Um, but somewhere along the line, the numbers have been changed to eight and seven. And six other graves were then interred from the edge of the cemetery up to that point. So there's some um, irregularities, if you like, um, relating to what happened um, immediately after um, events on the, the, the 8th and 9th of November at Cagney Court Cemetery. So I always believe that it's important to actually go to the scene, if you like, to see what there is. And this is a photograph from the road. Um, I was able to do this in January, um, the very end of January, just before uh, COVID struck, um, before lockdown. And this is what you see from the road. It's quite a small cemetery. And once you walk up, you're confronted with this scene. Um, the two rows in the foreground um, would not have been there uh, on the um, 9th of November, 1920. They, they were subsequent burials. However, right at the edge, if you can see the, the grave that's sliced really by the, by the frame, um, that was the, uh, one of the two burials that Captain, Captain Fisher made. And again, when you look at these graves, I tend to think that you know, the body is underneath the stone, but you have to um, 
en envis envisage in your mind the, the, the length of the grave, you know, the six feet or whatever out from the stone. And you can see then there is a gap um, uh, just on the third row there, left of center. And the gap is wide enough for three bodies. Now, if we are saying that the bodies were buried there, they were unmarked. And if they were unmarked, they would not have been with crosses. Um, they, they would, those crosses would not have been replaced by stone, headstones. And th there would be a gap there today. So um, when you put everything together, um, is it beyond doubt that the three unselected bodies were interred here at Cagnicourt? Um, no, it can't be proven beyond doubt. But can it be proven on the balance of probabilities, um, which is the civil, um, if you like, the, 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 the civil degree of proof? Uh, I think that based on the orders that we've seen, the amendments to the, the, the burial records, and quite glaringly the gap in the cemetery here, um, I think that there is a case that this is where the three remains were interred. So I leave that one to hang in the book, to be honest. And I, I think it's quite apt that w whether they're there or not is, is known and unknown, as they say, and in the words of Rudyard Kipling, known unto God. Um, and when I went there, actually, um, it was quite a moment. And I turned around and went back to the, um, the Great Cross here. And just on the left, you can see um, at each of these cemeteries, as I'm, I'm sure most of you know, there's a little cabinet. And in the cabinet, there's a, a graves, um, like a visitor's register, if you like. And in that, I simply wrote my name and the date and the three words, known unto God. Um, so that's really almost, almost, if you like, the, the end of the presentation. Um, the frustratingly, and uh, Anne Donnelly is here from Northern Ireland Screen. Um, about a week after that, my book was sent uh, to the printer, um, not that long ago, just probably about three or four weeks ago. Well, well more now, but five or six weeks. Um, through a chance conversation with Carl Walker of the Psalm Association, um, it transpired that uh, film footage, um, which belongs to Ulster Television, um, had been acquired uh, by Northern Ireland Screen um, for cataloging. And it was footage that was taken in 1966 of the veterans when they returned uh, on a pilgrimage to the, the battlefields and in particular to Thiepval in France. And uh, Anne has kindly um, agreed that it can be shown. And um, the, a number of the things that um, has come out of this, if you like. One was Fitz's role and the, um, the, the role that he actually played. And I, I've, I've sort of hinted around it and I've, I've pointed at it and I've, I've said that he, it appears that he was in a, a planning role. Um, and also the, the, the point of Cedric Hardwick and the misinformation. And again, I've, I've hinted at that and I've, I've found it in his book and all the rest of it. And um, it was just that, well, you can, you can watch the footage and you can see yourself, but it was a pleasure to actually, um, if you like, be vindicated by the man himself. So I think if, uh, Lindsay, if you can show the, the footage. Uh, Colonel, you were associated with the unknown warrior who yes. was buried in Westminster Abbey. Well, General Wyatt was the commanding officer in France, and we submitted schemes for the unknown warrior, and the one we submitted was approved by the War Office, and I was the executive officer to carry it out. And uh, <clears throat> nobody has ever yet stated how the act of operation was carried, and it's still secret, and I don't know whether I'm bound by the Secrets Act or not. But great care was taken to ensure that uh, the Daily Mail, who sent over a gentleman, <clears throat> they offered fifty pounds to the sergeant major who was in charge of the office, and uh, <clears throat> we made a file for him and sent him off to Lane and Warren uh, in a <clears throat> convoy headed by Cedric Hardwick, 
later Sir Cedric Hardwick, who was the camp commandant. And uh, <coughs> the cartridge was then brought down to Boulogne. <coughs> the body was kept in the fort at Boulogne, guarded by French soldiers during the night. And uh, <coughs> the coffin and the brass coffin that it was put in afterwards were supplied by the coffin makers of England. We then got it down to the quay at Boulogne the next day. <coughs> General George had forgotten to supply a, a gun carriage. <coughs> and uh, we raked up um, what you would call a, a wagon. And it was really better because we were able to get the coffin up much higher. And the boat sent over to, the destroyer sent over to take the body and the coffin to England in tribute to the French was His Majesty's ship Verdun. You were, I was in charge of the operation, in charge of the parade, and did the whole thing. I'll find out afterwards whether I'm allowed to tell you how it was done or not. <laughs> Thanks very much. <laughs>